Thank you, members of the council, for this opportunity to testify. Um, is the clerk here that can pass this out? There's a study here from UC Berkeley Policy Advocacy Clinic that was done in 2012. I think you might find very interesting, along with a petition of almost a thousand signers that are opposed to this bill, these bills, especially the sit and lie. Now what the research report does is it covers 19 jurisdictions that have implemented sit and lie laws, including seven in California. And what they found was, and it's there in black and white, as Jenny Lee said, that these laws are not effective and they show no increase in economic activity or increase in homeless services. Um, and so they only, what they do is they prolong homelessness and they also tax the taxpayers because they're very costly. Now what that presents is that th these measures are not only unconstitutional as applied or as they're enforced, uh, which opens you up to lawsuits, which my organization will be committed and forced to uh, help if these laws are passed, um, but they also create an unfunded mandate. As Bill 7, in years past, the sidewalk uh, nuisance law, had unforeseen costs attached to it that we now know total millions of dollars per year in the enforcement um, of the sweeps, not, to not even including the storage fees, this law, these, all of these sit and lie laws, will incur millions of dollars in costs that are not actually addressed in this bill. And for that reason alone, this bill, not in the minimum level, needs a rewrite. Uh, not to mention, I'd like to underscore over and over again, that even though the mayor said that this, the Ninth Circuit Court uh, said that the Seattle law passed constitutional muster as written, what he didn't know, probably, is that the full decision, the Ninth Circuit Court underscored that if these laws were challenged as applied or as they were actually enforced against homeless people, these constitutional challenges would be successful. That equals hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal fees that you would have to pay out because of this ordinance. Um, you would also have to reflect on the accurate number of unsheltered houseless in the Honolulu area. Now, according to the national point in time count, that's 785. Now, the UH did a study in 2013 as well, um, the Center on the Family, and their count is much higher for those who have accessed um, houseless services. The unsheltered amount almost totals 3,200. Now, your RFP providing for an increase in housing first, though it's a step in the right direction, will not adequately address the um, the entire population of unsheltered houses or chronically ho houseless. So the issue of shelters is really a moot issue. They can't address this problem, and they shouldn't have to address this problem. Uh, the issue is affordable housing. Now, as far as IHS is concerned, and I'll wrap it up, I know I have run out my time. Um, there, there, you do require fees. I was there myself. Uh, as you heard testimony from a worker in the ER, they require ID, uh, TB clearance, which could be obtained after admission, of course, they give you some time, but also a letter of homelessness and a fee. Now this fee was paid uh, for by my agency. I have it on videotape that it was a requirement on the spot that this fee be paid or else my clients would not be able to enter. I have it on a recording. Also what I have on tape, or actually a picture that was sent to, us, to, to me by a staff member that I won't mention, is several bed bugs in this picture mm -hmm. that still exist in the shelter. Um, also, I'd like to point out that the policies from IHS itself state that, and this is in the guest house rules, page two, you need to pay for the shelter fees. You will be asked to leave if you do not pay. It's right here. Okay, even though you have the right to clean services, which they don't have clean services because of the bed bugs, you also have uh, the right to the access of information, which they don't have access to information because through these savings accounts <coughs> that Jerry mentioned, he didn't mention that they take out actual individual savings accounts and then give people access to their own account numbers. They're not given access to their account numbers. All they're given is a receipt that they're responsible for keeping upon exit, and once they exit or are discharged from the facility, then they're given what they paid into a, the account minus the um, interest. 
Now, in economic terms, this is completely unethical. Okay, you cannot trust the word of an embellished social service who has an economic incentive to pass these criminalization bills. You have forced, you will be forcing this once honest and good social service to become economically dependent upon the criminalization and the future perpetuation of the criminalization of their own clients. And as a social service provider, quoting the ethics of the National uh, Social Work Society, Association of Social Workers, that in itself contradicts that being, contradicts everything that that social service is supposed to stand for. Thank you. Thank you. Members, any questions? Uh, Ms. Jian, Council Member Monahan has a question. Hey, thanks. Thanks, Kat, Enjoy. for being here today. And I, I really appreciate your testimony. And, sure. Uh, you know, uh, from, from, I guess, the, the committee's standpoint, um, you know, it, it's, it's, <coughs> these are difficult bills to tackle. And it, it, these are tough issues. Uh, but these are difficult decisions that, that I think need to be made. And I'm not, I'm not crazy about it personally either. But you know, you, you've seen, you know, you've seen the, the problem here. I, I respect you for, for being out there firsthand and, and being on the front line of this issue. What do we need? What more do we need to be able to, to um, in your opinion, to be able to solve uh, the homelessness issue rather than criminalize homeless? What has proved to work, if you look at the sit and lie study, and it's a very quick read, uh, they propose uh, solutions that have already worked in addressing homelessness. You know, the sit and lie has proven not to work. It's gone backwards. It actually um, uh, works against those who try to end homelessness. What does work are several programs like Housing First, um, Street to uh, Housing from New York, um, Square One from Berkeley. Those are already established models of housing and housing uh, projects like Housing First that have proven to work. Why, why, cannot, why can't we uh, invest in those? And that just takes a little bit more time, but in the long run, it will help those who are potentially at risk of being criminalized with a criminal record, which would make it more difficult to get a job or anything. Um, then, you know, focus on this. And with, I, all we're asking you is maybe another year to get these projects off of the ground. There's no reason to focus on the immediate need that the Waikiki businesses are saying that are affecting their economy, which is not proven. You have no actual studies to make this an empirical statement, none whatsoever. And the costs constitutionally, as well as morally, are very dire. You not only have the constitution against you, you also have God. There are a lot of, there are a lot of people from interfaith churches from all over, like Buddhists, Christians, Hindus, Please, they're all telling you the moral grounds on this is, is firm and established, and please don't interrupt that. Thank you. Oh, well, I would like to finally say that the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness, or USICH, in 2010 strongly advised local governments to refrain from enacting laws that criminalize homelessness. They asserted that such criminalization fails to increase access to services, they themselves, and tend to create additional barriers between homeless people and access to housing income and employment. Thank you. Thank you. Members, any further questions?